welcome to episode 8 of a season 3 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Sunday 16th of May and in this special episode you'll hear some exclusive interviews recorded at the Ubuntu Developer Summit in Brussels. I'm Laura and with me this evening is Tony. Hello Tony. Hi Laura, it's just the two of us this evening. It is. Why is that? Because Alan and Davey went to UDS. Ah yes, we sent them off to the Ubuntu Developers Summit which is where the plans for Maverick Meerkat are being fleshed out or were fleshed out and discussed. Um, Alan and Dave were our, our roaming reporters there, um, and they got loads of uh, interviews from people who they nabbed in the bar afterwards, I think, on the Friday, um, talking to them around the hotel um, as the week wrapped up. And it didn't seem worth Simon making the journey just to do an intro? No, I hope we spare him the, the drive in the rain, and just say a quick hello, and then get on with the uh, the content. In this episode, we'll bring you three interviews. First, it's Robbie Williamson, who was the platform lead for Ubuntu 10.04. He was responsible for making sure it got out the door in good shape. Then we'll hear from Keith Cook from the security team, followed by Rick Spencer, who's the desktop team lead, and he'll talk about replacing the F-Spot photo manager with Shotwell and the Quickly application development helper. With us today, we've got Robbie Williamson. He's from Foundations, or not? Um, yeah, so it's kind of complicated. So I guess when I first joined the company, Canonical... Um, I was found managing the foundations team for Ubuntu, which is the core OS plumbing layer, um, boot installer, package management tool chain and such. Um, that was back in October of 2008. Um, prior to that, I was at the Linux Technology Center for IBM for many years. Um, and so I did, I guess I came in about a week before Intrepid. It was insane. I don't know if you remember that release. There was like a bunch of crazy kernel respin late at night. We didn't know what we were doing. We were flying off the handle. It was crazy. I was like, this is my first job. I don't know if I want to work here. You know, I was up to 4 a.m. It was nuts. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just testing ISOs. Um, and, you know, subsequent releases, uh, uh, Jaunty, Karmic, and such, I was just running the foundations team. So then shortly after, I guess, Karmic release, I... Um, Matt Zimmerman was going to do an internal company rotation. Mark wanted his senior folks to be able to know more about the business. Um, he had done it with uh, his launchpad lead, uh, Kiko, and now he was, it was Matt's turn. And so it, someone had to backfill. And it, just because, I guess, maybe the position I was in with Foundations, having to touch, you know, server, desktop, and such. Plus, they don't really need me in Foundations. It's like the, you know, like the rock stars, like Colin Watson, Michael Volt, you know. So anyway, I'm useless there. So I said, sure, you know, I'll cover. And Lucid became mine roughly short after, after last UDS in, in December. And uh, yeah. how, how did that, that release go? I mean, it was obviously we had Lucid. issues right up a, a, at the very end. But right. uh, on the whole, how did, how did the release go? Um, it was good. I mean, I think a lot of it, to be honest, was because of the, the great work around the work items that we put in. That was kind of spearheaded by Rick Spencer on the desktop team, and Pity created that great tool. So we actually knew what work we had to do. It, was, it wasn't just like sticking your finger out in the wind saying, uh, I may be done in a month, you know. So is that the, uh, the, the famous burn-down burn, charts? Yes, oh, yes. Everyone, everyone loves I, the burn-down oh, charts. I, I told Rick, if I didn't have the burn-down charts, I would have not. It would have been very hard to just come in, jump in on that and run with it. I mean, there was some other stuff. We were starting to work with Google a little bit on Chrome OS. Um, it was hush-hush at first, and we were allowed to talk about it, and then I was dealing with that and some other stuff internally. But And then I had my son, so I had my second son in December. So it was all at once, you know. <laughs> um, but overall, yeah, the work items saved me because I could get a snapshot of what was going on, um, see, see problems and such. So what was the actual job title you took on for that six-month rotation? I wouldn't say, I guess it was acting CTO, but not, or just platform lead, right? So just getting Lucid out the door was my, my job. And by that, I mean, you know, the manager's job that I managed. So it was, it was awkward, but we, we made it work. But yeah, so I was responsible for getting out the door, making the tough decisions on things that, well, there was disagreements and someone needed to make a call. I was like, yeah, just go do it that way. Um, I also played a role, I guess, earlier on in making the whole LTS two beta pull from testing kind of plan that was kind of my idea as well just because i wanted to actually make 
something, you know, everyone assumed like an LTS was like a rail or a SLS, but really up until then they hadn't done too much different. And so I said, look, let's make it, let's make it really stable. You know, let's focus on that, you know, less features, more quality. You know, we can have like pretty desktop features, but if you really look at Lucid, there wasn't a lot of technical stuff. I mean, besides the boot, which is huge, um, that was just a finishing something we started. But other than that, we didn't really cram a lot of technical things in. It's- did did that make much difference the the change in the way you did the release cycle? Um, yeah, well, I so I think the, the uh, developer membership board or maybe the tech board, someone's ran ran like a uh, kind of like a, a survey and got the inputs. It was harder for some areas. I think overall, syncing from testing and having the two beta cycles was good. We wouldn't really do it every release because it it slows certain things down. Testing obviously and Debian testing doesn't get as much you know crackful stuff that we like to pull in and is unstable. Um, but um, I think overall it was good for the LTS, but it's not something we want to do every release. Okay, if you had a chance to redo that stint, what would you do differently? Hmm, what would I do differently? I don't even not have my son at that time. I mean, I really don't, you know, if I could reschedule that. Um, honestly, that I mean, I, I think I just, I mean, I don't have any regrets. To be honest with you, so now we've we've got past Lucid. We can mm. put that behind us right. in terms of getting the release out the door, and we're at UDS. Mm. You're clearly going to be busy working on new stuff right. for Maverick. Right. What kind of stuff are we looking for in uh, in Maverick? Maverick? Um, I think it was some of it mostly was summarized today. Um, there's going to be some work on Touch, obviously. That's gotten a real big buzz. I mean, obviously with the iPad and everything. I don't think we're going to be anything near that for 1010, but there is going to be some work around Ubuntu and, and Touch and what we can do there. Um, um, in Lucid, we actually enabled, like late, late last minute, we enabled a bunch of Touch drivers. Um, uh, Mark had said, look, can we do this so we can have people playing with it by 1010? He said, well, we looked at it and said, sure, it's just kernel drivers. So we did it with a little bit of testing and had the community support. Um, Software Center is going to be doing in-app payments, or at least payments processing. I don't know about in-app payments. I know that's a big deal um, to allow. I think we're focusing on other people to be able to sell software, not just like a canonical thing, right? Um, I, I, actually, I think that's the first thing. Like, I think Rick said, look, you will be able to sell one thing in Software Center. We don't know, but that's, like, that's a big deal for us. Um, I think uh, Ubuntu One is going to be adding some more services. That's something pretty cool. Um, they, I was in a session where they were talking about streaming music to your phone that you've purchased on Ubuntu One. I thought that was pretty slick. Server, obviously, it's cloud, 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 cloud. Um, more of that. Um, there was a cool session on ARM servers. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that's a big, big deal that we're going to look at going forward. So something you confirmed today um, was that we're targeting for the 10, 10, 10, so 10th of the 10th, 2010. Right. Um, how, uh, uh, does that raise any concerns for you? Um, initially, when I was first asked about it, it was months ago, Mark sent an email with, like, titled Unusual Request, and I saw 10, 10, 10. I was like, he's crazy. There's no way. We lose three weeks. We're not doing that. And then it's like, end of discussion. And then, he, you know, Mark's very persistent. So <laughs> he slowly started circling, talking to developers. But we all held ranks. They all said, oh, you got go, to talk to Robbie. I said, <laughs> I said I said, oh, man, 10, 10, 10, we lose. I said, let me, let me just look at it. I said, I'll do my due diligence to look at it. I looked at it, and I said, I just don't think we can do it. Um, I said, well, why don't we do, like, 10 a.m., 10 minutes, and 10 seconds or something like that, you know? And he's like, no, it's a once-in-a-lifetime marketing opportunity. I said, okay. I said, well, let me see if there's another, you know, some other. Let me look at the schedule deeply. So I started looking at it. It was a couple nights ago, actually. <laughs> and I started thinking about how I always, we always feel rushed in the 04 release and how there's always this, like, dip around December time frame when people go on holiday and such all over the world. It's not like, I mean, people go through holiday throughout the year, but it's just a big dip. And so I said, well, if I, if I really be honest about it, maybe we can get close to it. And started looking at it, and it just happened to line up that it was October 14th was something that would really do it. I think from here on out, we were releasing in the middle of October and the end of April um, to keep that in mind. And so it'll be in the month, so the cadence is there, but it was a focus on development and bug fixing. Um, there was some concern that maybe we should move the April one away from the end of the month because it's, it's only a matter of time before there's that, you know, you know, whatever, 05 release, <laughs> you know, 1205 or something like that. I, I, to be honest, I don't think so. I mean, we, 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 we've gotten it down to almost like a, almost a science as far as running these releases. I, I, I mean, we were able to respin at the last minute still, and we got it out the door. So something the project's been working on for quite a while is to try and, as best possible, unify a release for other projects. Now, we're in a similar time to the GNOME project, aren't mm. we? Uh, how, how does that interfere with that? 
Yeah, that was a concern. I mean, I gave it a little thought, but to be honest, their schedule kind of slides, I mean, recently. And I've heard rumors that it may not be out there. So I, I said, look, sometimes I've done previous schedules and I've looked for theirs and it's not up yet. And I was like, look, i got to get this out. So I said, look, we just have to lead the way and just throw it out there. And if there's problems, there's problems and we'll deal with it. I, I mean, there was, you know, release coordination was, was, I guess, the meme we were trying to push around Debian. Um, people thought we said we meant, you know, release uh, coordinating the actual date. It was more of collaborating around key, key, uh, key components of the release, which we did actually. Debian and, and Ubuntu are sharing some major things like tool change, Java, and a couple other key components, so that you know, if there's a bug in one, the, the other benefits and so forth. Um, Does it make a difference that it's a the one after LTS? Is it considered a, a kind of a bit of a playground? Uh, can we can we use that? I, I realize it's still right, a right, release. right. No, still no, I, 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 the cowboy release, right? Maverick. Yeah. Um, I think before I think it used to be that way, but you know, there's that whole talk about crossing the chasm, right? And that now we're starting to get mainstream users who, I mean, are going to be less tolerant no matter what. They're going to expect a little better quality. Now, it is an LTS release, and if you're using LTS, I think by default it won't, it won't, it won't trigger upgrades to the next LTS. Um, so we have that going for us. But I think we, we can't be as, 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 I guess, careless in our, in our quality. You know, it's not saying we have to sacrifice features, but it has to be more rigid, you know, think it through and, and be a little more disciplined when it comes to scoping out what we're going to do. Um, and like again, I said, those work item trackers help a ton. I mean, the developers were a little resistant at the beginning because it just seemed like more work. But then they were like, this is great. I love it. I can see what I'm doing. I can see where I'm trending out so I can cut stuff back. Before, it was just like a, it was, we were driving blind. I mean, it was literally, there were some times I was like, well, you, you told me that was ready. And they're like, oh, well, I didn't, you know, it, it was, we were, we were cutting things at the last minute. And it was frustrating for everybody, so. Does your team have much interaction with the community? I mean, obviously, you're, I guess most of you, your large proportion of your team is canonical mm. people. Is there much interaction with the community? And if there is, is there, any, is there anything extra the community can be doing to help your team? My team being foundations? or um, We have a little. To be honest, it's just kind of the boring stuff, right? I mean, you know, I call it the non-sexy bits, you know, the stuff you don't know about until it breaks and everyone knows. Um, Software Center, I was talking to Michael Volt. I, I know that that's picked up some community involvement just because it's kind of getting some coolness. But it's still, I think, more front-end work. He does the back-end. Um, boot plumbing, not really. I mean, we have some community members who are just rigid and help us out. Release management even is something that my team owns as well. Um, so you have your Scott Kittermans of Kubuntu um, coming to regular meetings and so forth, helping with that. Um, um, Super Mario, Mario Limoncelli. Um, he does a lot as far. I mean, and yeah, he works for Dell, but trust me, that's not the reason why he, he, he does so much that he does. That just has to be a coincidence. Um, so, I mean, if you're interested in those, those, those bits, you know, boot, packaging, a repository, uh, you know, the archives, stuff like that, sure, ring us up. Um, where, where can they find out more information? What, what, would it be through Motu or uh, mm. kernel team for testing, that kind of stuff, QA team? You mean find out more about what we do, or well, find out more about how they can contribute and, contribute. and help? Because we find a lot of a lot of people don't know what they can do hmm. that can help. I think the first way is testing. It's really great a way to get in, involved. Um, you know, uh, the, using it, reporting bugs, following through. Uh, sometimes we have call for tests, and that, that, that's really useful for us. Um, yeah, I mean, any way you want to get involved, it doesn't even have to be technical, right? If you just want to start just being a fan of, of Ubuntu and and, and t- explaining to people what it is, I mean, we. We gain a lot. We don't have we don't have a real marketing. We, so Canonical has marketing, but they don't market Ubuntu at all. And that's really we don't want to do that. People ask, well, you know, why don't we have commercials and such? We have the best of all. We have users who believe in it. That's way more powerful than some cheesy commercial. You know, maybe we get to the point where we we need that or or can do that. But until then, I I'd rather have you know dedicated users who who, who love it than somebody being paid to sell it. You know. So with us today, we've got Kez Cook. And uh, he's from the security team, and we're hoping you can tell us a bit more about what you do. So, what does the security team do? Uh, well, I'd say the, the, the main thing that the security team focuses on is providing Ubuntu and all the stable releases that we have with security updates, um, making sure everyone's machine is up to date and secure and um, safe to use. Um, and top of that, we, we develop proactive security measures so that um, new issues that come up that people might be vulnerable to, they aren't as exploitable, so it's not as uh, unsafe as they might have been. Okay, so how do you actually become aware of potential security issues? Um, there's 
pretty large community of security researchers in the world, uh, both open source, closed source, from all sorts of different companies and backgrounds who uh, are actually looking for them. You know, they're auditing software, they're trying to break into stuff, they're trying to find those things. Um, and then <clears throat> that stuff gets published and, and uh, there's a, a list of CVEs, which is a, a unique identifier for, for individual problems, and we go through a huge list of them and you know, stay on top of it, and, and that's, that's where uh, the problems come from generally. So as a security contact for the distribution, uh, do you actually become aware of these before they're actually disclosed publicly? Um, and how does that actual uh, disclosure process work? Um, many of them are what's called embargoed, which is that just uh, the people who are usually you know, upstream for the software or in distributions, um, if usually for more severe problems, um, they notify everyone that is going to be affected for the distribution, the upstream, and everyone involved in making it and building it. Um, and you know, everyone figures out the problems that they need to solve, and then everyone works together to publish it. So, uh, so that you can everyone at the same time releases, and then the pub- the, the issue becomes public, um, and then there there is a very small window of potential attack. Uh, the way of looking at it reduces the exposure window that people have in that situation. So there, there is collaboration. There's no. It's not a case that you know we're trying to get a patch out before Fedora or before oh, you know even yeah. Windows or OS X. Is right. there cross collaboration between open source and proprietary vendors as well? Yeah, definitely. There's there's a lot of collaboration because it's. I mean, it's such a fundamental part of of the whole ecosystem, if you will, is just making sure everybody's safe at the same time. No one, no one's really trying to outdo anyone else on, on those types of issues. So it's, it's a great way to collaborate with everybody. Okay, so that, that, that's largely quite reactive stuff to issues you've uh, uh, countered. Um, I understand that your team's working on some proactive things to make things more secure for the future. What are some of the tools you're doing with that? Um, a, a lot of it... Um, so from the beginning we, we started with Debian and uh, and moved forward from there historically and uh, there had been a lot of proactive work done to harden the tool chain and do a bunch of other things to keep programs from misbehaving when they were attacked to begin with um, and uh, Ubuntu has been playing a lot of catch up trying to fill in those gaps and, and uh, involve a lot of those features in the tool chain and everything else that we that we've uh, that we build into Ubuntu um, and Lucid is really awesome in the fact that I feel like we're, we're there, we're caught up uh, and we're as safe if not safer than uh, you know, any other Linux distribution finally and that, that's pretty exciting for me and I feel like we're in a position, a good position to start trailblazing on more proactive stuff. What kind of challenges did you have through the Lucid cycle? Because now we've, we've released Lucid and it's an LTS release. Are there any particular challenges you recall from that cycle? Um, nothing hugely jumps out at me, but you know we spent a lot of time trying to focus on um, reducing uh, this, the, the number of libraries, for example, that do the same thing, but we have multiple versions. So if there's something broken in one, it's going to be broken in all of them, so that's a lot more work to fix each library, so trying to get rid of that duplication and, uh, and trying to focus on the stability and, uh, and making sure that you know, we didn't have any known crash bugs and you know, other things and in, in features that we, we were working on. Okay, so the core, the core of the security team is actually employed by Canonical. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you actually have a community following, and is there any plans to try and do do what what what, what can they do? Um, yeah, we've we've definitely got uh, on Freenode. We have uh, Ubuntu dash hardened is the is our thing. If you go to Ubuntu dash security, you're automatically forwarded to there to that to that channel. But um, but we've got a lot of people hanging out in there uh, talking about various things, and we have people you know sending in patches and trying to trying to fix things and test issues and, and you know keep keep things safe uh, you know helping out with with everything else that's going on um, and we'd, we'd like to see more people doing that and we're trying to improve documentation and make it easier to do testing because you know n- most people run what's current for them in Ubuntu you know people are going to say oh hey lucid I'll run that but you know the, the core security team still has to worry about party and and things in between and even on server we're, we're still supporting dapper on servers uh, for a little bit more so when someone's fixing a security issue and it's in dapper and they go well 
how do I test this? I don't, I don't have this easily available to me. You know, what do you mean I need to start up a whole virtual machine with the entire you know, archive available to install software? You know, sometimes that's pretty daunting to get started on. You know, the, you know, if, since we do it you know, all day every day, we've got all these tools set up. You know, we've, we've gone through that. But for one person wanting to fix one thing, the, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to do that initial setup to get a, a, a VM working. Um, so we're going to try and reduce that barrier to entry and uh, make it much easier for people to get involved in that testing. So do you have um, a wiki page or set of pages with documentation that help people get started, or has that so far been really quite internal to your team? Uh, no, we've got, we've got a lot of wiki pages on, on the uh, wiki.ubuntu.com slash security team. Um, there's quite a bit there. Um, what, what we identified during UDS this week was that we don't talk a lot about how to get that testing set up going but you know we talk about all our procedures and we talk about our roadmap and we talk about uh, all of the proactive features and the processes you know a lot of different things that we do and how to get involved and how to triage bugs how to open bugs how to you know do all these things but but uh, we realized that we were missing this one piece that might be <clears throat> more of a problem uh, for people to get involved more easily so we're going to try and fix that in the, in the coming weeks and get it better documented get people involved uh, you mentioned um, sessions here at UDS. Obviously, we're here planning the next release of Ubuntu. Um, are there any particular sessions that have stood out? Do you, do you, or was there anything particularly important to you to do here at UDS for for Maverick? Um, for me, for me personally, the one the one thing I'm excited about is uh, a bit of kernel hardening that I'm looking forward to doing. Is now that I feel like we're caught up in a lot of areas, I'm I've been looking around at, at other distributions who whose primary purpose for existing is really, really tightened down security. Um, and I want to try and uh, see if some of their approaches to things in the kernel uh, will work in a general case. And, and I believe they will, and I showed the kernel team what those, what those things looked like, and they did not freak out, and I think, I think it will be good to add those, uh, those new features, and I'm excited to work on them, so that'll be good. Do you have any kind of um, battle in any way with with other developers when you're trying to harden things down and they want, you know, does, it, does that hardening cause um, issues with making programs functional for users? And do you, do you have a battle trying to get your way? Well, I mean, that's traditionally the, 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 the hard part about security is to get something secure without getting in the way of the user. You know, if, if people see security, you know, if they see something blocking them, uh, you know, I, it, it hasn't worked. You know, we, we failed at providing a good, clean you know, user-friendly solution that, that was going to be good. Um, so sometimes you have to figure out what the best approach is for dealing with that. And, and with, the, with the much more strict uh, distros that have these, these changes, um, a lot of them are not really good for a general case. Um, but sometimes you can add the feature but not enable it by default. So that, you know, uh, like, f uh, usually this applies more to servers, but, you know, if you have a server admin who's really interested in some specific feature that works for his environment... Ubuntu has the feature, and he can turn it on, and you're and they're happy about that. Um, with other stuff, where I try to fight for things on by default, I will end up sometimes butting heads with people where we differ in opinion on you know how many people will be affected by this, who will have to change you know what they're doing, and things along those lines. But I mean, it's it all boils down to a matter of opinion in those corner cases, and trying to figure out how to make it you know as accessible as possible. Um, tends to be, you know, it's it's an interesting, it's not a battle, you know, it's like, these are these are my colleagues, I respect their opinions, and, and it's it's fun to try and work it out. One of the um, sessions, uh, in, within one of the sessions, I, I remember seeing something about uh, changing UMask. Can you explain a little bit about what that is and, and why that needs to be changed or might need to be changed? Oh, sure. Uh, it's it's a little strange, but uh, the UMask is what define the, the UMask is what's the default setting for permissions on files when they're first created. Um, so uh, right now, uh, what we get from, what we inherit from Debian is uh, what's called 022, which means that everybody uh, who is not your user um, and, uh, and not, or well, basically that's it. Like those, no one else can see, can write to your files, that's good. Um, and then with, with 22, other people uh, can't, write to the files that you've created for your group. That's what the second two is. Um, the idea being that 
if you have open access, you can see other people's files and you can share data and you can do these other things, but you can't actually modify someone else's files. Um, but the problem has been that uh, by default, Ubuntu has each user has a group that is named the same as their user, so everyone has their own group. So it doesn't make sense to block this group right because by default, um, your group is also unique to your user ID, so it doesn't. There's no difference in getting rid of that second two. Um, so the proposal was to have zero zero two, which means that by default you could write to group owned files. Um, and what this does is in situations where you're sharing uh, trees of files where you do have a supplemental group that's been set on those files, uh, it's much more easy to you know upload a Git tree without doing anything special. You, know, you can you can if you can write to that group, then when you create new files in the Git tree, they're the correct permission and everyone can see them and everything is fine. And this this has appeared to be a well understood problem and everyone walked into the session expecting a bit of a battle and everyone sat down and said, okay, 002? Oh yeah, that sounds good. Um, let's sort out how we can make sure we didn't break anything, you know, or make anything unsafe for, you know, large, you know, installs with lots and lots of users who all share the same group. We don't want 002. And as it turns out, someone else has already thought of this. It's already in PAM. We just need to turn it on the correct way. So it was completely uneventful, everything was great, and there's already an implementation, so done. So where can people find out more if they do want to get involved in security team or find out more about what you guys do? Where can they find out more? Um, I, I'd say the probably the wiki page um, is the best place, uh, wiki.ubuntu.com slash security team, and from there there's a getting involved link and there's information about what we do and the different areas that people might be interested in, um, and that's that's basically it. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Cool. Thanks. So I'm here with Rick Spencer, who uh, works on the desktop team. Your desktop team lead, is that right? Yeah, it's the titles engineering manager, but the lead is a good description. Yeah. And uh, what are the highlights from this UDS? So this was a really creative UDS. We had people from a lot of different, a lot of new parts of the community. We had somebody from Upstream Chromium here. We had the new Debian project lead here. It was just, you know, that that was a big highlight. Just like a lot of new ideas getting injected into the process. I'm really excited about some of our decisions too that we took. We took. Um, uh, really exciting decision to default to Chromium if we can at all swing it on you just on UNE um, and we took a decision to switch to Shotwell for image management and I'll be talking to the guys from Yorba next week we set up something we can you know chat about it but they've been they seem pretty excited about it from their response to some of the bugs some of those decisions that get made often um, they just appear in the distro and, and people out in the wider community kind of see these changes and they don't realize kind of the thought process that goes mm. on. Can you explain a little bit about how you come to these decisions? What, what process do you go through? Sure. Well, this is actually something that we do quite transparently, but just maybe not everyone's hooked in and doesn't see what we're doing. So uh, the first thing that we do is we do something that we call logging blueprints. And a blueprint is essentially a web page on Launchpad that states an intention. And then anyone can edit that page, and they can say what they think about that intention. So we had one called Simpler Image Editing in Ubuntu, and we listed different um, image editing tools, different things that we could do up there. Um, and then there was a little bit of discussion on that uh, page. Then uh, we have a session at UDS, and a session at UDS anybody can come to. It's an open-door session. Anyone can come and talk and contribute, and we hash out a decision there. Now, if you can't come to UDS, well, people also get an audio stream. They can listen, and they can communicate back on IRC. So it's very much an open discussion. And then we um, take a decision as a team, as a group, um, Sometimes those decisions are easy to take. Sometimes they're controversial and a little bit less so. Um, but we take a decision and then we document it again back in the blueprint. And then we break down the blueprint into like what we call work items, figure out what we need to do to make it happen. And then you start to see as the work items get done, you start to see the effects in the distro. And in terms of um, replacing applications, so you mentioned that FSpot will be replaced by Shotwell and um, 
whatever browser is on UNE, Firefox, I guess, it gets replaced mm-hmm. by Chromium. How do you manage that process of converting people over? Do you do you do you take account of the fact that they might have data in those old applications? How how is that going to work, or is that not yet planned out? Well, it's not specifically planned out, but we do have principles about that. So if you have um, First of all, if you're upgrading, we don't typically remove your old application if you've been using it. So we can usually see if it's configured. If there's no data and hasn't been configured, sometimes we'll just replace it with the new one because you're not using it. There's nothing lost there. Sometimes we decide that we better leave the old one in place, but we'll put the other one next to it, let you get used to it a little, and then maybe in a later release. Um, Often we do do an in-place replacement. What we're probably going to do with Shotwell, for instance, is if we can, we'll run upgrade scripts that then take all your data that you have in F-Spot, make it show up in Shotwell, and you'll have a seamless experience in the Shotwell if, if we can pull that off. F-Spot has been around for quite a while, and, and obviously there's a bit of controversy about it being a mono application, and, and Shotwell doesn't have that baggage. Um, does that factor into the decision-making process, or is it is it totally a technical decision, or is it a space issue, or how, how do you come to those kind of decisions? That, it's very multifaceted. So in terms of uh, F-Spot being mono, that doesn't really enter into it. I don't really buy into the mono is evil and you should be scared of mono line of thought. I don't, I don't know how you feel about it, but it doesn't really... Um, that that aspect of it doesn't concern me. We think about the users and what's the best experience. So our goal is always to ship Ubuntu with the best that's currently available for users in free and open source software. And at the moment, we, as a community, after a discussion, feel that Shotwell is a better option for users. So currently in the LTS release, we're still using FSpot, and that's still going to be maintained, but for all new installs onwards, it's going to be Shotwell. Yeah, that's correct. But um, we'll we'll continue to deliver F Spot, and if you prefer F Spot, that's still an option that we will totally you know support. And you know if that's your if that's your image library client of choice. We really want you to use it, and we want you to have a great experience on Ubuntu with it. And Robbie Williamson's uh, have been talking about changes to the. Uh, the schedule, what with the ten ten ten, and mm-hmm. um, maybe shortening the the development cycle, is that going to have a deep impact on your work, or is that less of a problem than it might seem? Well, um, I actually think it's kind of a neat idea, and I'd like to see us do it. Um, I think it would be really fun. Um, I think uh, maybe when I started uh, as the engineering manager about say a year and a half ago. I started with with Jaunty was my first release. I think it would have been a much more threatening kind of change for us because our planning process was not very granular. And so it was very hard for us to predict what we actually end up going going to deliver. But over the last few releases, we've started that those work item uh, system. We've started to uh, use burn down charts and other scheduling systems. And now we have a lot of data about how much work we as a community and we as a team can get done. So now I'm kind of like, you know, it's just another schedule. So we'll just conform to that schedule. Yes, we'll get less done in this release by a small fraction, but that means we'll get more done in the next release by a small fraction. So I think it's all going to balance out. And um, I'm a big fan of Douglas Adams. I'm 42 years old this year. I really hope we do it. <laughs> That's convenient. And one of the other things that people may have uh, seen you um, famous for or blogging about is uh, Quickly. Can you tell us a little bit about Quickly, what it does, what it gives us, and, and how people might be interested in using it? Sure. Yeah, Quickly is a project that um, I started with Didier Roche, who's also on the desktop team now, but he was a community. He was working in the community at the time. Um, and this is... The users of Quickly are application developers. So if you want to write a program that runs on Ubuntu, you might want to be a Quickly user. And what Quickly does is creates an application, um, it starts an application for you. So it kind of gets a starter application for you going. And uh, Kind of like a development framework. Well, there, there's that aspect of the, the development frameworks are already there, but we bring it all together. So if you say quickly create Ubuntu project Popey's app, um, it'll create an application called Popey's app. 
um, and then you'll use Python and the Python library and all the open source awesome stuff that runs great on Ubuntu. You'll write your killer app. But then the next step is maybe you want to put it in PPA. Maybe you want to release it in some other way. You want to package it, for instance. Uh, that can be pretty hard to do, except with Quickly, we set it up so it's already integrated with Launchpad, so it's very easy to, um, to package it. It's, you, know, you can say Quickly Share, literally type two words in the terminal, and it'll upload it to your PPA for you. So it's that integration with the developer tools, landing it on the desktop later. That's the heart and soul of Quickly. And you've made some, what I've seen, uh, called opinionated choices about the fact that it uses BZR, it uses Launchpad, it's Python, it's GTK, mm. it uses Glade. These kind of you know, tools and, and choices that you, you've made, do you see it ever expanding into other languages and other, um, other tool chains? Right. So, yes. Yeah. So, um, those opinionated choices are very opinionated, and we're very firm about them, but they're limited to the Ubuntu application template. And quickly itself just runs commands. So um, we are hopeful that you know, other people will make other templates that are maybe for different tool chains. So if you want to make it easy for people to say make a general purpose GNOME app and you think they should be using C for that or you know, whatever other choices, we hope that you are inspired to write a quickly template for that and then people can use that to more easily contribute to GNOME. You know, you'd probably be using Git, probably using freedesktop.org, you know. Um, so it's meant to have that kind of flexibility. We do actually have three templates, but since we wrote them, they're all Ubuntu-specific because that's what we know and love. So there's also a, there's a Ubuntu application template, which is for making a, a program on Ubuntu that's, you know, just a general kind of windowed application. But we also have a command line template in case you want to make a command line application and there's a, a game template in case you want to make a pie game you can get started with those and once someone's created their um, their application they can put it in a PPA I understand there's a, a, a blueprint for the next release which looks at trying to get those things more easily deployable or easy for people to get those into the to desktop yeah. can you tell me a bit about that Sure. Well, this is um, something we're really excited about. So currently, um, if you get a release of Ubuntu, it, for the next, you have to wait essentially six months before you can get new software on it, unless you go and add in PPA. And these are very technical things. They're also not necessarily vetted. They can do funny things to your system. And that, that's sometimes what you want. So we love PPAs because you can go, like, I want to, if you're like a highly technical user and you want to try the latest and greatest Xorg X server, you can go install that in a PPA. But if you just want to play a game that doesn't really change your system, like adding a PPA is, it's hard to find it. You, you know, you'll never discover the game and it's too technical to install it. So we're very excited in Maverick, we're going to make it possible so that the software center will light up new applications that are developed after it releases. So after you update to Maverick, if, uh, month later you write a um, application or a game or something that you want to get to end users you can make that show up into the software center even though it wasn't ready when maverick shipped and does that go through a review process are we talking like apple store kind of thing well yes and no it will be vetted but it's going to be vetted by the community so this is orthogonal to canonical it's important to us that there's no um conflict of interest where it seems like Canonical is trying to control the platform and Canonical is um, exploiting developers to achieve their own ends. But it's also important to us that users have good experiences with this and aren't exposed to badly written applications or even intentionally m written malicious applications. So just like there's a community process for what goes in the main, what goes in the universe, there'll be a pro community process to put a gate on these applications for that reason, those reasons. And will there be um, a facility for uh, developers to get revenue from that? Will there be a pay model, or is it still all free software? Well, um, it's going to be f it's for free and open source software, and there won't be any capabilities built into any our platform or the software center to get paid, at least in this release, in Maverick. Um, but you can use free and, so free and open source software if you want to, get paid you could just implement it yourself so there's nothing to keep you from delivering software to your end users and say that they could buy 
something from you content extended packs or something yeah so that'll be you know that's fine as long as it's free and open source software you'll be able to get it through this channel Fantastic. Is there any other things at UDS? Is there any um, memories of UDS now that we're at the end of the week and we're just winding down? Is there anything memorable about this UDS, your takeaway? It was really exciting having Evan here from Chromium and seeing the way that they build their software and seeing the passion that they have for Ubuntu. And um, I, um, I'm hopeful that we'll see uh, the um, other companies like that like kind of join the Ubuntu community. And uh, Evan and I were talking about maybe for the Chromium work that we need to do to make it run on UNE really well, maybe they could use our blueprints to track their status and stuff. And I just, you know, that was, that kind of represented a real, like highlight to me sort of um, how diverse the community is getting and how we can embrace people with different goals and interests and coding styles and stuff. Thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you. That's all for this time. We'll be back in two weeks with another clutch of interviews from UDS. In the meantime, you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And you can find our voicemail number, Twitter, Identica, Facebook, and the IRC channel and all sorts of other things there. And that's about it for this week. See you next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.